So it's my pleasure uh, this morning to introduce my good friend, John Chenoweth. And as some of you haven't recognized by now, uh, this two-day conference is really an opportunity and an excuse for me to have a reunion with people I've worked with for the last 20 and 30 years. Uh, no, it, but it's nice to see it. I feel very blessed to have worked with all of the presenters, the five presenters over the past, you know, three to 30 years. And I feel that it was a, a, a very a deep gratitude for them to come and to, to share their time with me and with us based on the experience that we've had together. And so John and Ken today, uh, from both from NVIT, uh, thank you very much for that. Thanks to everybody else. John is Dean. Uh, John and I were, what were we, the Dean 1 and Dean 2? Tweedle Dean and Tweedle. Yeah. <laughs> for three years until I moved here. Uh, and I had worked at NVIT for uh, seven years in the 90s. Uh, at the other campus before the new campus was built, but I'll let Ken talk about that. John is Dean of the Nicola Valley Institute of Technology based in uh, Merritt, but we have, they have campuses in Burnaby and do a lot of community outreach, and we're also entering into uh, partnerships with NVIT around uh, an MOU to start with our transferring students that they have into our five-year Bachelor of Education program. John is a UBC native Indian teacher education program graduate, NITEP, and former elementary school principal and district principal for First Nations education. His teaching career began in 1994, and he transitioned to the post-secondary level in 2007. John is a member of the Upper Nicola Indian Band in the Nicola Valley. John has been involved in First Nations education at both the K-12 and post-secondary levels for his entire career. And he takes that very seriously, having worked with him. John has been married for 24 years and is the father to two sons. John today will be talking about finding Kwam Kwam. I'm imagining post-secondary education for Aboriginal people. With that, please help me welcome John Chen. Section 11, which is uh, good morning in uh, Intlakamak, uh, language spoken in our territory, and also White uh, Hashkwikachin is in our Okanagan language as well from the Nicola Valley. Uh, must acknowledge the local First Nations whose territory we're on and uh, acknowledge everyone here who's visiting from, I guess, as far away as Waterloo. Is that the furthest one east? Okay. I don't know. But uh, welcome, welcome to this, this beautiful location. Uh, as Warren uh, did introduce, I, I do work at NBIT and I'm very proud to work there. Uh, I'm very proud that uh, my band was one of the five founding bands that created NBIT in 1983. I'm sure Ken will talk a lot about that in his presentation, so I won't, I won't speak too much on that. But we're very proud of our school. Uh, we're the smallest post-secondary school in British Columbia that is pu publicly funded, uh, but I think we do probably the most amazing work with Aboriginal communities across not only British Columbia, but across the country. So, and is Aboriginal education a passion of mine? Absolutely. Everyone who works at MVIT has that passion, or if you don't like the Kool-Aid, leave. That's kind of a mantra that our president has. And it's true, our, our Kool-Aid is Indian education, is building capacity in our communities. So, um, this presentation I'm gonna do for you today it's, uh, it's part of uh, my doctoral dissertation that I'm defending later on this uh, summer in August. So I wanna share with you some of my uh, research in both, it bridges the gap between K-12 and post-secondary, all in Aboriginal education. Uh, but being that it's NVIT, when I get into talking about my research, you'll see that I also included non-Aboriginal people because we wanna be inclusive. So finding Kwam Kwam is, uh, in our Okanagan language, our, our Silk language, it means uh, balance, finding balance and regeneration. And what I'm gonna be sharing with you today is a framework that comes from an Okanagan story uh, called the Four Food Chiefs. And within that framework lies the recipe to reimagine post-secondary education for Aboriginal people. 
and it's, uh, it's an amazing story, and I'm really, really glad to be able to share it with you today. I asked uh, our local linguists from, from the local language here, what does Guang Guang mean? Because it's all Salish languages, and I was told it means inner strength, inner strength. Mm -hmm. So it's another fitting, a fitting translation, uh, finding your inner strength, so finding Guang Guang. I'm going to talk a little bit about why why does this mean so much to me as, a, as an employee at MBIT and throughout my whole career? And that's important to place myself or situate myself in the research so that you understand why this is so, so passion, uh, such a passion for myself. Uh, I'm going to talk about what, what is the question that I wanted to answer in doing this research. And then funny enough, it's the same question posed in the story that I'm going to share with you. And the story is about 800 years old. So I'm trying to answer the same question posed by my community some 800 years ago. Uh, the theoretical framework, I believe the story was written for me, and uh, I'm gonna explain how the story provides the framework to, to solve this question. And I'm also gonna talk about some implications for post-secondary schools, for places of employment. Uh, what are the implications for you and where you are situated in your home communities and your work? And I know we have some students here today, so I'm hopeful that uh, it resonates with you around the way you're going to start your career working with children because it is such a privilege to have that role. Uh, for myself, I, I like to say that I'm, I'm from a family of educators. My, I'm Okanagan on my mother's side, and I'm also uh, Shtatlium, and I'm also Intlikamra, which are all in the Salish, interior Salish. On my father's side, I'm Irish and I'm Swedish. And for, for myself, uh, just, just to give you a little background on my grandmothers, they're both very powerful women. Uh, my Aboriginal granny, quiet, reserved, but would grab you and pinch your ear if she needed to. <laughs> my, my Swedish grandmother would do the same thing, my mar for, my mother's father, right? Uh, when I graduated from NITEC in 1994, we were told by Dr. Werner Kirkness that you had to wear your regalia. And I said, I'm wearing my regalia, just like what I have on here. She said, well, go borrow some moccasins. I said, I'm not borrowing moccasins, because I don't have any moccasins. Right? And then uh, I was also told, when you're up there, introduce yourself and the First Nation you're from. So I had a very, very tough inner dialogue with myself going, if I say I'm John Chenoweth, member of the Okanagan First Nation, my Marfor, my Swedish grandmother, is going to kill me because I won't acknowledge her. Mm -hmm. So I went into the longhouse and I introduced both grandmothers. My Swedish grandmother looked at me and nodded, and I knew right there she went, you're off the hook. <laughs> and, and that was her way of saying that. So, but my family, my father is, uh, was a teacher. He passed away a couple years ago. Uh, he taught with marginalized people in special education and also a program in BC called Work Study, Work Experience. And as you could imagine, as the data shows today, most of the students are, uh, Aboriginal people are overrepresented in special education and programs like work study, work experience. So my father worked in the marginalized population for his entire career. Uh, my mother was a First Nation support worker. She's retired now. In, uh, she worked in Kamloops. And she worked in my school. And that wasn't the most fun thing either. <laughs> uh, she dealt with a lot of the disciplined students because what do they do with the kids who are kind of bad? put them with the Indian Ed support worker. So my mom had all the bullies in her office. And so it wasn't the funnest place for me to be. I'd never go there. And I wouldn't go there anyway. But she was in the school where I worked, uh, or where I was a student. So that was, that was an interesting experience for myself. Um, I graduated from Calum Secondary School in 1984. And I was talking to one of our board members, Shane, up here. Uh, he mentioned that he's uh, going to a Kamloops Aboriginal grad, and I think there are 200. And 204 Aboriginal grads in the Cal School District this year. I went, wow. When I graduated, Nelson Reese, the MP, had a dinner, and there were eight back in 84. And that's, that's, quite a, that's quite a leap. Now, being somebody who loves numbers, you gotta wonder, of the 204, how many are on reserve? How many are off reserve? So I always wanna delve into the numbers and the data, but it's, a, it's a, such a positive thing to see Eight, 204 in 
I'll say how old I am, but 30, 32 years, 33 years, somewhere around there. That's quite a leap. That's uh, quite a, a, a leap in, in progress for our, for our students going through school. And there's a lot of reasons why that's happening. Uh, I would say, namely, it starts at home with, with parents. And uh, I think Kelly mentioned yesterday the number of Aboriginal people going to college is uh, very, very high. And in BC, I think, I think there's around 23,000 Aboriginal people in post-secondary in BC. I don't think I know them, because I look, I research it. Uh, but of that 23,000, half are in programs that don't require grade 12, right? Half the Aboriginal students. But that's still, they're in school. That means they're being role models to either their own children or nieces and nephews or the neighbor's kids. School is important. So that's gonna have a dramatic impact. Um, when I started working in the school district in Merritt as a, as a teacher and as a First Nations resource teacher, um, I, saw, I saw firsthand the conflicts between our Aboriginal communities and the school districts. And they were spoken of yesterday around uh, when, when uh, we were talking about the treaties that they just don't exist. Well, in a lot of ways, there wasn't really a need to change the system because the system was fine just as it is. And this is in 94, that's not that long ago, right? So what's wrong with the system? We'd be doing it this way, it's been working out pretty good. Uh, but with a 32% Aboriginal completion rate, that's not that good, and it's not good enough, right? So there's things like that happening in, in school districts across the province. I, I think that uh, the First Nations Education Steering Committee has been a, a major catalyst in a lot of change provincially for our school districts and our First Nations schools. So it's a positive effect having such a, a big motivator behind the K-12 system, the province, namely the province. And they've also been a big push behind INAC around funding for off-reserve or on-reserve band-operated schools. So you need a lot of political will to make things change. And at the post-secondary level, Another organization that's uh, provincial, the Indigenous Adult Higher Learning Association uh, that operates or, or helps to, how do you say this? Uh, they are basically supporters of about 40 Indigenous adult college kind of settings on reserves or within tribal councils around the province. And so those, those types of organizations keep Indian education as a priority like for, for governments and we need that. And, and you young people who are just coming through education, uh, hopefully you get to teach for at least 10 years before you're hauled off into some type of leadership role because you will be hauled off. And hopefully you get a little bit of a grasp of what does it mean to teach, because you need that, okay? Don't let them just haul you off right away. Um, in terms of my observations, we got a lot of kids coming out of high schools and that's uh, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal that don't know what they wanna do. Mom and dad know they're gonna graduate and they know they're gonna go off to college. I know what I want my kids to study and that's probably what they're studying and that's not the best thing for my kids, right? And, and I know that because, well, geez, I became a teacher, right? My younger brother's a teacher. My older brother was a teacher. Like, holy cow, that's, that's a lot of teachers. Um, I don't wanna do the same thing to my own kids. And, and I want them to choose their own paths, but it's, geez, it's, it's painful sometimes. <laughs> Some of you might know. Because there's a lot of dips and valleys around. I want to do this this week, and next week it's something else. And you're like, okay, yes, yes, yes. But it's painful. <laughs> you know that. Um, one of the stories I want to share with you has to do with actually another one of our board members, uh, Paul Donald. And he, he lived down the street from me in Cowles. And I like to say in Cowles, where I grew up, we didn't live on the other side of the tracks, we lived between the tracks, right? The CN and the CP. And on that street, there were about nine students that attended public schools in Cowles, uh, probably about 90% of them Aboriginal, right? So that's eight out of the nine. There's one, Mark Francis Scudo was an Italian, lived down the road, okay? He, he was just down this road from us. Um, but anyway, I, I recall there's no crosswalk, there's no, there's a train you have to get through. And the trains run all the time in Cows, so you're always late for bus. There's no bus, our, our school is over four and a half kilometers away. There's no bus, because they're not gonna run a bus for nine students. And so I remember my dad always pushing the, the school district, nothing really changed. So, uh, but Aaron, 
I call him Aaron because it's his middle name, Paul Aaron Donald. But Aaron lived down the street. We, we didn't, like even though my father was a teacher and my mother was a first nation support worker, we didn't have a lot of stuff, uh, materialistic stuff, because a lot of their money went to more social activities. And by that I mean uh, weekend drinkers okay, as my family. So when I, when I talk to my wife about some of my upbringing, she's like, holy cow, you guys live like that? I'm like, well, how else, how did you live? Right? That's the, you only know what you know. But I used to look at Aaron and say, holy cow, how do they do it? Because they had nothing. We used to give them our hand-me-downs down the street. And he was speaking at a, a function, a business case competition in Merritt, I guess about six, seven years ago. And he mentioned that uh, he's a bank manager. He got his uh, business, uh, business admin degree from SFU, became a bank manager with the CIBC. And now he runs, I think it's probably one of the biggest Aboriginal banks in Western Canada, uh, All Nations Trust. And he was saying that if it weren't for my mother, he wouldn't be where he was today. And that really made me think about the impact that a school system can have on a child. And not only a school system, an individual. Right, so I mentioned that to my mom and she gets, she gets all teary, I say, oh, Aaron, oh, Aaron. I said, what did you do with him? She said, I just, he just knew that I loved him. Right, so that kind of resonated with me a lot. And it resonated with me around what Aaron said about that. And I, I want to delve into that a little more because my mom didn't know he felt that way, right? And, and it kind of leads into a little bit about my research or what I want to do. Because students like Aaron, he shouldn't have graduated. He should have been part of the statistic. Probably should have been in jail or dead, okay? In reality, poverty, very low socioeconomic region. Uh, single mom on welfare, bank manager, right, doesn't fit. Why, does someone care? That's what we need to delve into. So I had, you're only allowed one research question in your uh, doctoral dissertation. I picked three, but I, I do really only have one. It's one of those three, okay? But I like to share the three questions that go through my mind. Now, one of them is, uh, re revolves around the nature of a previous experience for students. Now before you even read those, I'm going to tell you what am I looking at. I'm looking at Aboriginal people who dropped out of the K-12 system. There's lots of them. In BC alone, we could probably guess there's 40 to 50,000 people that have dropped out of the K-12. And that is such a stigma. We get a lot of those students at NBIT. Universities don't really go around and make it a marketing strategy to say, geez, why don't we target Aboriginal dropouts? It's not in the language, right? Nobody does. A lot of the regional colleges do a great job in trying to do programs for the local First Nations, but in a role, I would say, reminiscent of, I'll tell you what your community needs, mm -hmm. that type of thing. We're gonna give you upgrading, and these are the courses you get to pick from. So nobody's targeting this group, okay? I, I think we're born of this group at MBIT, okay? And, and in reality, when I think about that, that is our niche. The niche for us is the dark underbelly of Indian education, okay? The students that are on welfare, getting $240 a month, and that's my life. No, we want you. Come with us. Uh, almost like telling Aaron Donald, come with us, right? That's kind of our niche market. And I think, uh, as Ken will probably speak to later, that, that's, that's kind of what we do. Like there's a lot of Aboriginal students that go through K to 12 and they're getting B's and A's. You know what, they're going straight to UBC or they're going to VIU or they're going to UVic or SFU or wherever. I pat them on the back, Godspeed. But those ones that dropped out and are drifting into the dark corners, come with us, mm -hmm. right? That's what we want. Here's the questions I want to know from those students. What, are the, what was the nature and impact of their experiences before they came to us at MBIT? So I made them dig back far into their memories. Some of them was only two years, some of them was 15 years, some were 20. Tell me about your experiences before coming to us. Uh, did these students ever realize that they had the potential to be great students? At W5, I want to know. I, give me the details, because I like details. Okay. 
and what attributes based on their feedback, what attributes exist to create an environment that we can all learn from. If you do this, you might get this. So when these students have the realization that they, they geez, I can be a great student, what's going on in that moment? I want to know everything about that moment and then give it to educators and say, what do you think? Are you doing this? Can we do this? Is there anything we can learn from this? That's basically the nature of my research. But my one question is probably the third bullet because you have to have one question. Now, the theoretical framework that I'm using, and, and, and in all reality, uh, this, this Okanagan story I'm going to share with you is the best model to explain exactly what I'm trying to do. And like I said, I feel that this story was written for me 800 years ago. And it was written for Indian education. But the Anelkin Wook process, it's, uh, it's a process of dialogue. It involves an oppositional dynamic. Because in order to achieve balance or quam quam, you need opposing forces pulling on each other, coming together or going apart at the same rate or else you upset the apple cart, so to speak. Okay, So you need to have a dialogue process in order to achieve that balance. And the concept of timuch, we've got the same word here. Yes? Yeah. Check with my linguist over there. That's, uh, that's an indigenous uh, way of knowing and, and in my research and working with Dr. Jeanette Armstrong, it's uh, axiology or value that all things in nature have with each other. And it's very powerful to think that uh, all the knowledge in nature is twining together constantly or it's unraveling together like a rope uncoiling. That is tumuk and it touches everyone. So each one of us imagine a coil of rope coming out of us. This table, a coil of rope coming out of it and coming into it. And the Anelkin Wook process is visually me giving you my information drop by drop into your head and you doing the same to me reciprocally and it's all about the Tamuk. So therefore, as it says there, we are all Tamuk. Right? We are all the land. We are all everything. So those are the two concepts I'm going to use that are found within this story. Okay? So this just kind of summarizes what it is. We've got the Anaukan Wook process. It's exemplified in the four chief story, and it's overlaid or tied to the individual's primacy of place, land, or Tamuk. Okay, so the four chief story, the Anaukan Wook process over top of Tamuk. <coughs> so important. Those are our four chiefs. Those are the, the best clip, art, clip arts I can find. <laughs> uh, we've got the bear, the salmon, the Saskatoon berry, and the bitterroot. They're the four food chiefs. Okay? And the, and the story, the four, food, the four food chiefs happens in a time before this time. A, a time before there were people like us. There are only people like the four food chiefs. Okay? And I'm going to read with you the very first paragraph in that story. And then we'll get into the rest of it. In the world before this world, before there were people, and before things were like they are now, everyone was alive and walking around like we do. All creation talked about the coming changes to their world. They had been told that soon a new kind of people would be living on this earth. <coughs> That's us. Okay? Even they, the animal and plant people, would be changed. Now they had to decide how the people to be would live and what they would eat. The plant and animal people had to decide how the people to be would live and what they would eat. If you think really carefully about that, that's my research question. Okay? The people to be uh, translated from the original story. This is a translation to a children's version. So the High Okanagan language used in this, people to be is translated as Shkailuk. And the literal translation of Shkailuk are people torn from the earth. So I, everyone being Shkailuk, you're torn from the earth. And we heard that when uh, one of the elders or the drummers yesterday said that we're all indigenous to somewhere. We're all torn from the earth somewhere. 
right? So therefore, in, in this story, I, I say it's written for me, but really it's an environmental ethos. But it is about looking after the environment in a lot of ways. You've got the four-legged creatures, you've got the berries, you've got the salmon and the water people, and you've got the under the ground people. So all elements of food are represented. And it's the stories created to teach people how to look after the land so that we can continue on forever in the Tabu. Because without it, you don't have balance, your world ends. Okay? This is the first kind of paragraph in the story. The story goes on to do this. They, they met for a long time. They met for a very long time. And in terms of time, it could be a thousand years. The story doesn't say how long, it's just a long time. And finally, they said to the bear chief, you are the oldest and wisest amongst us. Why don't you tell us, the three other chiefs, what you would do so that the people could, the people to be have food and they can survive. And the bear chief thought again for a really long time. And again, we don't know how long, but it could be a really long time. And finally, Bear said, I will give up my life and the life of all the four legs and the flyers to be food for the people to be. Now, yesterday in one of our small groups, we talked about a self-sacrifice as a form of leadership. And that's an, uh, an Okanagan leadership's value is that you self-sacrifice to create a model for others to follow. And that is what the bear did. She self-sacrificed by saying, I will give up myself and all my people to be food for the people to be for us. And then she said to the other three chiefs, what will you do? Salmon said, I will give up my life and all the life of the, the fish in the, in the waters. Saskatoon said, I will give up my life and all the foods that live on the berries and the trees. And Bitterroot did the same for everything living under the ground. Okay? So when that happens, great. Everyone's in agreement. The circle is remaining balanced. By self-sacrificing, they move in a bit. Right? There's, there has to be an oppositional equal, or else you have imbalance in the system. So Bear has to actually physically lay down her life and die. And she does that. And in order to bring Bear back, honor songs need to be sung to bring Bear back to life. And the three chiefs start, one at a time, singing their honor song to honor Bear's sacrifice. Bear does not come back to life. There's a murmur going along um, amongst all the communities. What's going on? It's not working. All of Bear's people sing their song, honor song. It doesn't work. All the other chiefs' communities, people they're responsible for, come and sing their song. Nothing is working. They have another in Alkin a talk. Why isn't this working? What are we going to do? If we sacrifice ourselves as food and, and we can't be brought back to life, our world ends. The Tamuk spirals no more. Finally, the fly comes along. And fly, do you notice I got a little fly? I kind of, maybe it look like a fly, but that's a fly. <laughs> Fly's the last community member. Where does fly live? Yeah, we know, right? In the corners. In the recesses of the community. A nuisance. Unwanted. Fly comes along, lands on bear. Sings an honor song. Bear comes back to life. Okay? Bear gets up. Thank you for honoring me with your song. Fly tells all the other chiefs present that never forget that even that smallest, weakest, minuscule voice in our community can have the most powerful song to sing. Okay? That's a lesson. Fly turns to everyone and says, that is why we give honor to the sacrifices of all of our community members that make us. So you will all sing this song when, you sac when, when its sacrifices are made for you. Right? So the, the message there was, even the smallest, most minuscule, maybe unwanted voice person has the most powerful song to sing. 
And that's how the story ends. And it, it originally was, I mean, Dr. Jeanette Armstrong pulled out of that an environmental ethos. That is why we sing and give honor to all the food sacrifices for people. Otherwise, we wouldn't have anything to live on. And when you think about Aboriginal people having a deep, deep responsibility to look after the earth, it comes from old, old stories like that. That we have a responsibility to give honor to the sacrifices made by our people. And they are our people, they're all of our people. Those fish, food, land, people. And that's why there's such an environmental ethos. Now, my research is not environmental. Mine is educational. So I'm gonna share with you how I took that story and turned it into education. This is the uh, oppositional dynamics model. And you can see that uh, the bear is at the top. And it represents enduring stability. Solid. That's why they called upon bear as the oldest and wisest. This enduring stability. Opposite of bear, we've got the Saskatoon bear, the Shia. Represents persistent change. Persistent change because Saskatoon berries get eaten by birds and by bears. It's kind of funny, but bear is the only one here that eats all the other community members, right? But Saskatoon gets deposited elsewhere as, you know, poop and throws the game. Salmon, independent action. Four years back. Four years back. Doesn't need to be told, it just goes. Shreetland, Bitterroot, interreliant connection. It relies, if you want to find Bitterroot, it's got to be a perfect condition the perfect temperature, the perfect soil combination, enough composting, whatever, to make that root grow. And sometimes it doesn't grow year after year. You have to find it, find the perfect conditions. And people who are good at finding Bitterroot or Speedlum, they have to look for what was the weather like and I'll know where to go look. Because it, it's interreliant on so many factors. Okay? The concept of Timuk, that should be a spiral, but I couldn't find one. For a, for a picture, but if you think about Tamuk, again, it's that uncoiling of a rope from the individual right out through to the Tamuk or the place or the land. Okay? So you've got to imagine that uns unspinning. And I put them on top of each other now, as I mentioned. So for, for an educational purpose, you'll see that I've got uh, different concepts written in. Okay? I've got uh, indigenous identity. I had indigenous knowledge and my, my, one of my advisors said, I don't know if it's knowledge what the students are telling you in the research. I think it has more to do with identity. And as I read through all the survey results, I think she was bang on that it has more about identity. Because what is enduring stability, um, what has survived 500 years of colonization, colonization? And you couldn't remove the Indian from the child, right? That didn't happen. The identity is still there, and that is the enduring stability. And it's so important as part of our educational framework as well. And an opposite, a natural accrumo to identity is policy. Government, politic, uh, any kind of policies that have to counterbalance identity. And if you want to think about imbalance with our students, in their K-12 experiences, schools were not set up to allow for that identity to, to do well. And you wonder why so many people don't graduate. Uh, they, they don't see themselves in the schools, right? There's an imbalance. It's like, it's flipped. Something happens. And if you think about Tamuk needing balance, policy and identity have to counter each other. So as identity keeps giving, so too must the policies. And we are seeing changes slowly but surely in, uh, in government funding for programs. Are they going far enough? Most of us would probably argue no. Uh, IC. It's not an uh, IC drink. It's Indian control of Indian education. I call that as independent. You're kind of going out on a limb. You want to run an Indian control Indian ed school. Band operated, Ayala. Tribal Council, NVIT, we're out on a limb, <coughs> alone, in a lot of ways. 
right? So that's independent action. Opposite of that, we've got the Aboriginal community, which is inter-reliant connections. And that speaks to the emotional relationships we have as communities within our families and our extended families and our neighbors, even as far away as from here to Merritt. Right? There's a connection. There's an inter-reliant connection. Even our, our, our friends from Alberta, there, there's something that we're all shkailu, right? And it's a given. So that, that interconnectedness is there. It's evident in all of our Indigenous people. This all sits over top of the individual, the family, the community, Timu as education. Okay? Over the Timu. So one big leap that I had to make was Timu has to have balance and regeneration. If I put education as Timu, I have to fully believe that the education system has the ability to find balance and to regenerate itself. And that's a, almost, that's another leap of faith. Because the education system is one of the hardest things to change, as most of you will know. So I, I had to go there and say, yes, it can change. Yes, it can make a change. The Tumuk is ever evolving. Now, interestingly, if we are all Tumuk, we're not the center of Tumuk. So at the center of this Tumuk, there's the question. How will the people to be survive and what will they eat? Translation in education, what attributes exist for Aboriginal dropouts to be successful when they return to post-secondary? Translation back, how will the people survive, the people to be survive and what will they eat? Okay, I've taken the same question and just put it to academics. It's an 800 year old question. In, in this story, you gotta remember, indigenous identity that is enduring stability has, has survived centuries of colonization. It says, I know what I will do for the people to be. And the people to be are future students, okay? I will give up myself, my identity. And by giving up your identity doesn't mean you're not an Indian. It means I'm gonna give it to the system so that the identity of, of indigenous people is, is really honored and respected. That's the sacrifice identity gives. Policies need to do the same. So the government takes a look at, and even now with the Aboriginal framework, in the K-12 with uh, all the Aboriginal funding that they're putting forward, they're trying to make strides toward, to balance identity's sacrifice. Are the government sacrificing enough? We'll see. Because is the system balanced? Can we achieve quam quam as it is? And that's probably the debate that happens on an ongoing process across this land. Indian control of Indian ed, what are we going to give? NVIT. Uh, everything. Everything. Right? We have to. And we expect communities to do the same. And they expect us to give. And, and a lot of times, like when we work with communities, they'll say, oh, by the way, we've got uh, students that we want to do a program with and we don't have any money. Okay, Ken, we've got a community that has a number of students, wants to run a program and they don't have any money. What do you think? Well, we know what he thinks. We'll find the money. We'll make it happen. Right? We have to both give all the time. And we have to have a mutual respect. But that creates balance. So after, in this framework, when indigenous identity says, I'm gonna self-sacrifice first, to show the government, to show schools like NVIT, and to show our communities what we need to do so that future students can survive in the educational commute, she lays down her life, okay? Our honor song didn't work, didn't bring her back to life. Policy song didn't work, neither did the Aboriginal community song. Whose song worked? The flies. Who's the fly in my model? The dropouts. From that dark underbelly, right? Just as in the old story. So fly comes back. And when I, I asked the students a question, one of the main questions I asked them was, 
Can you recall a moment when you realized you had the ability to be a great student? And I've got like 85% can vividly remember that moment. Vividly remember that moment. So and I said, tell me about that moment. That moment that they're describing for me is the fly singing its song. Okay? So when you think about that, marginalized students saying, I'm in. I've got it. They're singing their song. It keeps the education system alive. And the parallel here is we're only as strong as our weakest link. We've got a lot of people who are so marginalized, they're not even part of the chain, right? So that's where we need to focus, and that's what we do at MVIT. We, we really do. Um, so they, them sharing with me the moment they realized they were great students is the fly singing its song, okay? Now, I've got some research questions. I want to revisit them with you. What was the nature and impact of the educational experiences before they came to us? I've just written down four things there, but they're pretty common in a lot of the responses from the students. Self-esteem was not an issue, but self-confidence was. Now in that, I, I asked, here, pretend you're one of those students. Okay, you're all those students. One of the first questions I asked you was, when you were in high school, did you consider yourself to be attractive? Answer in your own head. Put your hand up if you're brave. Okay, that was one of my first questions. Uh, another question, did you feel like you were humorous? Did you feel that you had support for education at home? Uh, did you feel that you had the uh, ability to learn? Did you feel like, uh, I don't know, you were athletic? Those are the five. And the sixth one I asked, did you have any hobbies outside of school? Uh, resoundingly, for the five questions, 69 to 94 percent yes with the Aboriginal students. So for me, those questions speak to a person's self-worth, uh, self-esteem. If I was a great high school teacher, grade 10 to 12, and you told me I've got a group of students coming that scored 69 to 94 on those questions, I'd say, let them at me. Come on in. Because they're highly feeling good about themselves, motivated students. And around motivation, when I ask if they have hobbies outside of school, amazing how many hobbies going on from drumming, dancing, uh, sports and, and community teams, you know, berry picking, uh, mechanics, you name it. They're motivated kids. Well, they're not kids anymore, but when they were in high school. Motivation wasn't an issue. Ergo, self-esteem was not an issue. And yet so much we see, so many times we see, we need to bring in a motivational speaker for the Aboriginal students. We need to bring in someone to work on self-esteem. That's not the problem. I think we could save school districts a lot of money by saying, don't spend it there. It's not, that's not the issue. You know, last night when we were watching the dancers in the community cultural center, I was looking at uh, a couple of the young men and I thought, you know, that, that it makes me think about those folks know who they are, right? To be able to dance that song and know what it means. Well, they could be sitting in Warren's school uh, next fall. How important is it for Warren's school here to know that that kid is tied to something huge, right? A lot of the kids are. And whether or not, uh, like for my community, uh, we're a horse people, a lot of the kids are cowboys. Well, in school, that's not celebrated at all. Like, very, like at all, if any. So they can't see themselves there. So it's, it's really an imbalance for them. It doesn't fit, right? Self-confidence. Uh, we've got, well, we've got a kind of a saying at MBIT called GTFO at MBIT. And that means get the fear of. For all you texters, it's not what you thought it was. <laughs> T-shirts uh, and everything. Yeah, well, we even had a T-shirt made, but it didn't make, pass the scrutiny of our 
sales office. <laughs> but, but in a lot of ways, in, in regards to self-confidence, uh, get the fear out, right? Never be embarrassed, never be afraid. And by never being afraid, it doesn't mean you gotta get angry if you, if you feel, like if you feel wrong, you need to speak up. And right? we tell students that all the time, sometimes too much, because then we get a lot of students saying, hey, I don't like what's going on in your school. Right? So we say, well, hold on. Like, I'm glad you're speaking up, but let's rethink things. But we want students to get their voice. Because right? there's nothing more powerful than a student who has a voice. Racism was prevalent in the memories, mainly, well, especially with the Aboriginal students. They felt that uh, a lot of their experiences, their most negative experiences, had to do with uh, what they perceived as a racist teacher. Okay. Just flat out, flat out, blatantly, uh, you know, they, they see it as racism, and I don't think you can see it as anything else. And the uh, Attorney General, Auditor General of BC this last fall put out a scathing report on the education system saying that there is a racism of low expectations with Aboriginal people in this province. Right? So some of the stories the kids said, I wasn't allowed to take Psychology 11 because the counselor told me I wasn't university material, so I wasn't going to waste a seat on you. They're like 35 now, and they still remember that five-second talk. It hurts. Mm -hmm. right? It's being told, you can't do it, so why would we waste a chair on you? That student is now a social worker, so prove them wrong. They shared stories of poor teaching practice. I say poor teaching, this is for you teaching students here. Um, there's some things I read that was like, are you kidding me? Like one, one, one story was a student shared, and this is all their perceptions from their memories, but an instructor in a science class said, brought the student up who failed at the last term, brought her up in front of the class and said, do you all want to work hard in science or take it over again like her? And fail like her. Because she failed last term, and she's back here doing it again. And she said that she stood there like, okay, and went and sat down, dropped out about four months later. Mm -hmm. Why? That's just poor practice. And it's not even that. It's, it's pathetic. Right? But they also shared stories of amazing teachers, teaching practices. right? And so uh, things like a uh, teacher told me how great my French was and my... my my pronunciation was the best in the school in grade nine. Well, this person's 30. That's 16 years ago. They remember those few words, right? So the worst and the best, it doesn't take much to, to upset the apple cart, okay? And it's there. Uh, for those, one thing I want you to take note, most of this is happening in a classroom with a teacher, with an instructor, Did these students realize that they had the potential to be great students? This is the fly song question, I call it. Okay? 80% vividly remember this moment. Very interesting because if it's such a prevalent moment or a, a life changing moment, I don't know what you psychologists call it, but it's like a. What do you call that? Ingrium. Ingrium? Ingrium. Oh, no, 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 no. I mean, like, in, in psychology, there's a moment where if you start on something and it's a, a shift in your attitude. Pivotal. Pivotal. Okay? If, if they can vividly remember this moment, they're not sharing it with anyone. Right? They're not really sharing it. Well, they're not sharing it with us. The instructors aren't aware of it. Maybe they're sharing it at home. I don't know. We didn't, I didn't delve into that. Majority of the moments were in classroom setting with an instructor. There's a common theme here. Teachers. And it didn't matter who the instructor was. What matters was whether it felt like the instructor cared. So if teachers don't even know these moments are happening, how do they know if they're appearing to be caring? Those are interesting dialogues to have with your faculty. It's also, as a, as a dean, I'm going, well, crap. What's my role then? It's not happening with me. It's not happening in Ken's office. It's not happening at the board level or even in our elder's office. It's happening in those four walls of a classroom. So what's my role in that? 
And that's being selfish. Right? I know my role is to support those faculty in any way possible, hopefully, to make the positive moments. Because a lot of the faculty sit there and go, yep, it's happening with me. Okay? Right, Fake? Yeah? And, and I, I really want faculty to, to think about it and say, is it happening in your class? Right? Is it happening in your class? Every moment of every day when you're teaching, you're gonna, going to impact a student, <coughs> and a fragile student, with one sentence. Is it happening in my class? That's kind of a, a common thread we really want to push across to faculty, right? And to uh, people who administer or manage schools, uh, people who are janitors, um, support staff, you know, what is our role in ensuring that those magical moments continue to happen? Okay. Now, in terms of it didn't matter who the instructor was, that's a very nice way of saying it didn't matter if they were First Nations instructors, Aboriginal instructors, or Russian immigrant teachers, right? Like Roman. Um, one, one of the stories I'll share, we've got a Russian immigrant teacher at Burnaby, instructor. Uh, I really think he's sticking around MBIT because he wants to marry an Indian woman. <laughs> I really do think that. Well, I know that, because he told me that. <laughs> uh, but he, one of the students in my survey shared with me that she was born and raised east side Vancouver. Poverty her whole life, uh, alcohol and drugs in the home, dropout, child at 15. Single mom in college, her child has a child, okay? And I don't know if she's 32 yet. So really in a tough cycle. <coughs> and uh, she said that she was ready to drop out of NVIT because uh, it was so hard to read stuff on the Indian history of Canada. Because <coughs> she said, I was reading it and everything in there was about me. And she shared this with our board. Uh, in the research, she said that when that, when that happened, the instructor, uh, Roman, Russian immigrant, said the assignment was to tell me about your past life before coming to school. And she said it was very painful to read that stuff. And then in writing up her own story, <coughs> to bring up everything was so painful, she just wanted to leave. And she said what he did was he walked her back through everything she wrote, and this happened in about seven minutes. Everything she wrote and how that is always going to be a part of you. You can't cut it and send it away. It's always there, but it's never going to imprison you. And she wrote those words down and said, she went home that night and thought about it and is now, I think what, a diploma now under her belt? Yeah, going into third year, straight A's, and said that moment liberated her. Right, complete liberation from the Russian immigrant. Didn't matter. So I'm kind of scratching my head going, okay, Roman, hey, Roman didn't even know. Hey, Roman, did you know that this dude, what, 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 really, really? Like, what were you thinking doing that assignment? I just thought it would be good, right? Had no idea. So I think uh, implication for, for myself as a dean and, and faculty, the thinking about when you, whatever you're doing in class is having a profound effect, right? And how do you do follow-up and, and things, maybe not even follow-up, but just be aware that those kind of things could happen. Very powerful. What attributes exist that support success for returning stopouts? Uh, the first one, the instructor created a space. That was a, a common thing from the students, was that they would sit in class, wouldn't really participate. But the instructor created a space that made them say, okay, I'm in. And they would jump with both feet. Okay? And that was a very important thing. The instructors, again, they don't realize they're creating a space. But they are, through whatever they're doing, whatever they're teaching. Instructors lead students to revisit their personal history. That's the Roman example. And it was common quite a bit. As it's almost like being uh, taken by the ghost of Christmas past saying it's okay, it's all over there, it's always going to be a part of you, 
Now where are we going? Let's go look at the future, okay? Instructors had a deep, respectful awareness of the history of Aboriginal people, but with an eye to the future. And some of the stuff we're, we're sharing with students is painful. And in a lot of ways, you think about the Indian history of people in Canada, uh, not only do most Canadians know that history, most Aboriginal people do not know that history. We know residential schools, but only what we maybe hear or see in the paper or talk about at the band hall, or because we were there ourselves. But around the policies and the, uh, you know, all the ugly stuff, most people aren't aware of it all, right? And, and that's part of, the, part of the process of change that uh, we need to move on and it's gonna build for the future. Right? We have to. Identity is crucial. I mean, we have 80% uh, Aboriginal students at MBIT. Uh, yeah, there are flies, but I think they're coming because they, they want to be part of uh, a school that has at its core Indigenous values. <laughs> so they want to keep and maintain that identity. Right? And, and that's why so many post-secondary schools now have Aboriginal gathering places. Right? Because they're, they're seeing that that is so crucial. Students want that and need that. But not not at the expense of feeling separate. And so that's something important for places like VIU. How do you how do you encourage all students to come and take part in the rich culture? Right, that's really important. And and we we actually continue to work on that as a school. We have 20% non-Aboriginal students that come to MBIT. How do we give them the indigenous lens of education? in a very respectful manner that doesn't say, you're the white guy. That's not fun for that non-Aboriginal student. Right? And we've had cases where non-Aboriginal students are like, holy crap, man, that was a punch in the teeth. Right? So we need to be very careful and sensitive as well as, as uh, instructors, all instructors. Can the students see themselves in every aspect of the academy? I mean, in the K to 12, when you think about the uh, dramatic dropout rates of around 42%, 44% provincially, a lot of those kids, I mean, yeah, you know what? They're struggling with uh, poverty, low socioeconomics, but we've got a lot of kids that suffer like that and come through school system flying, right? So it's, it's more than just saying, well, they're low socioeconomics and all low socioeconomic kids suffer. Uh -uh. There's something more there. The students don't see themselves in the school. In, in a lot of, in any, any aspect. Why? And it becomes, maybe the school doesn't care about me or us. Okay, and that's a common thing. So how do we change that? How do K-12s change that? How do these new teachers change that? In terms of uh, motivation and space, I've got role models down, but in a lot of ways, we, we try to tell our students all the time, even like if you've dropped out, being a dropout carries such a stigma in our society, it's, uh, it's terrible. Right? I mean, in talking, talking with Plato up here, they'll hire people who have a skill, they don't care if they graduated or not. But, Tell that to a college. What? They have to have grade 12. No, they don't. Uh, Ken and I went to a First Nations Tech Council meeting. I think about three of the six CEOs of these small tech companies never graduated themselves. What? How can that happen? Okay. If I've got that attitude, I don't know if Ken did, probably did. I mean, what are the kids thinking? <coughs> right? Our trades program, we've got two instructors, uh, one non-Aboriginal guy who looks like a biker, uh, another guy from Bella Bella. One of the first questions they ask our bridging to trade students is how many of you never graduate from high school? And they do what I call the old shifty eye. I'm not putting my hand up. Right? It's just like if I asked you, how many of you are on Facebook? Right? You're probably gonna say, should I put my hand up? Or, and that's part of the fear, right? So when they say, how many of you never graduated? Eventually, all the hands go up. 
Then the instructors say, neither did we. And they look, well, how can you be my teacher? You dropped out, how can you teach me? What's the answer? They say, hey, not graduating, who cares? That's over there. Where are we going today? I never graduated. I, well, I'm, I'm talking about our trades instructor. I never graduated and I've had a successful 35 career, year career in the trades. Just because I didn't graduate never derailed me. So let's go. And everyone does sit up higher, okay? You can see it. So I think one of our, our big goals is to reduce the stigma of graduation, non-completers. We need to remove that. This is interesting, to help my community. If I was to ask 100 Aboriginal students anywhere, why are you going to school? A lot of them say, because I want to help my community. If I ask 100 non-Aboriginal students, Canadians, so I can get a job. Right? Well, the Aboriginal student needs a job too, but they want to get a job and help their community. So where does that come from? I want to help my community. It comes from the Timuk, in that everyone has a responsibility to twine all the knowledge in a common direction toward balance and regeneration. That is a inert, taught value in communities, that you always have to help your people. Okay, that's, that's an inner thing, that it, it, it's, it's real, and it exists. And it, it makes me, like I'm not a marketer, but I, I would rethink my marketing strategy. If I wanted to target Aboriginal people, I would say, can we help you help your community? You're gonna twig something in Aboriginal students' minds. Because it's there, it exists. It's within our stories, it's within our teachings. Uh, we do need spaces where students can learn of the legacy of colonization and reconciliation. Very important. And that's Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal students. It's got to be done in a way that doesn't make the non-Aboriginal students sit there and say, oh my God, look what I did to these people. Right? And, and it's got to be done in a way that uh, faculty aren't pointing at the non-Aboriginal saying, look what you did. Right? That's very hurtful. But it happens, it really does happen. And when we talk about, we do bring up talk, topics like white privilege, right? And that's, that's a very, very uh, intense topic. As a concept, what is white privilege? And have a dialogue with adults around it and leave with a deeper understanding. That's a, that's a very hard thing to do and requires a very skillful instructor to do that in a way that everyone leaves feeling better. Not even better, but more understanding, okay? Uh, we need academies to decolonize. I'll leave that to you to say, what does that mean? I've got my own version, but uh, I mean, it, it's basically doing things like this, having conversations, nonstop, open door. Um, having a relationship with the local indigenous people, crucial, right? Like. If, if, I'm, if I'm a northern college that doesn't get a lot of Aboriginal students or have a good relationship with communities, boy, first thing I'd be doing is having breakfast every day in that community and finding out why, right? But it's not happening. It doesn't happen. So. And the last one is really important, goes to that GTFO, getting the fear out. But students need to know that it's okay to fall down, scrape knees, because I bet you a lot of the Older people in here have a lot of scabs on their knees and scars because you don't learn without you know banging your head on the floor or hitting the wall or, or tripping on your knees. You learn from mistakes. And you need to be, it needs to be known that it's okay to make a mistake. Get up and say, okay, where do I go now? It needs to be okay to do that. This is your time now. So maybe in your, in your sharing circles, because we're going to break here, uh, I want you to, on what I've shared with you about the fly singing its song and uh, keeping the educational tamuk alive, what, is, what does that 
imply to you? Like, what are some implications for you and your organizations? Now, when I, when I defend this for my doctoral uh, dissertation defense, I only get 25 to 30 minutes to present this. And you guys got a full hour. So you got a little, it's, uh, that's way too long. And I would be skipping through some major points. But I, but I hope that uh, you can see how that story was written for me. And, and it was written for you. And I, and I hope you can see how that uh, we need music in our schools. We need songs sung. And we know who needs to sing them. So I want to thank you and thank uh, all the host schools for putting this on. And go home and make music. Thank you. <laughs>